Okay, Ling201, we're going to move on to a new topic today. Uh, after all that syntax, uh, we're going to actually devote the rest of the semester to the study of meaning in language. Uh, and we'll start off um, with a look at how we derive meaning from conversational context, uh, which is the study of pragmatics. Uh, and then after that, we'll move on to uh, the study of semantics, which is um, the study of uh, meaning in words or word level meaning, and also how you combine the meanings of words together into um, sentences to get meaning out of uh, entire utterances as well. Uh, so uh, that's what we have to look forward to for the rest of the semester. I'm going to try to get all these um, lectures recorded uh, and post them in, in one unit on Monday of next week. I'm recording this on Friday the 3rd uh, so that you'll have them all um, uh, on that Monday and then have a week and a half to do the final homework for the course, which is going to be due on Wednesday the 15th. Um, so we'll see uh, if I actually make that happen. Uh, and before we even get into pragmatics, um, I'm going to show you a couple things which may be of use uh, for you as we walk through this unit. So first of all, I posted a new um, reading under the readings tab on the course homepage, which I know I haven't used a whole lot, but it's here. So uh, this is Pragmatics from another linguistics textbook called Language Files, uh, which is the textbook I used to use for this course. Uh, and so I, I recommend taking a look through that um, because there's not a lot about Pragmatics in our textbook for this course. Uh, and also, before you watch this lecture, I recommend that you do this quick write number 23 on Pragmatics about these kind of oddball expressions that we use in the English language for various reasons. <clears throat> okay. So with no further ado, let's get into it uh, and talk about pragmatics. So um, as I was kind of alluding to in that little intro there, the meaning of a sentence can usually be derived from the meaning of its words and how they are combined together by the syn by syntax. So we're going to talk about this after uh, we talk about pragmatics. Uh, I usually get into pragmatics um, because I'm going to give you a little exercise based on... I usually talk about pragmatics first because I... Uh, normally give students a little exercise to do uh, where they do a little bit of field work and kind of listen to conversations in their everyday life and try to um, get examples to sort of um, use as answers for a homework question. I'll explain how to do that midway through this uh, lecture, um, but uh, it would be also kind of sensible to do semantics first because there's kind of a bridge between syntax and semantics as well. Uh, but we're going to study this from the conversational context first and then kind of go back down um, to semantics. So we're not going to think about the meanings of sentences based just on their words uh, at this point. Instead, we're going to try to figure out how sentences can get meaning out of how they're, um, depending on how they're used in particular contexts in conversation um, with other speakers. So to give you some formal definitions of this distinction I'm going to try to make. So uh, you can talk about a sentence, which is just a string of words put together by the grammatical rules of a language like we've seen in syntax. Um, and in this respect, sentences are abstract. They're just idealizations. There's something you can put on a PowerPoint slide or a piece of paper or in a syntactic tree. They're not actually physical events. We're just talking about sort of the relationships between words and whether or not they fit together um, coherently as a whole. Utterances, on the other hand, uh, are the use of a sentence in a particular context. So utterances are actual physical events that happen in the world around us. Sentences are abstract idealizations. Uh, and utterances, therefore, can derive meaning from the context in which they are uttered uh, that you could not simply get from looking at a sentence as an abstract form or an idealization of language. Um, and this is kind of the interesting uh, meat that we're going to dig into today um, to see how this works. So I'll give you some examples of sentences in different contexts. So sentence one, Kim's got a knife or Kim has got a knife, so on and so forth. Uh, you can think about the syntax of that if you want. Uh, we're not going to do that today. Instead, we're going to think about what context we might utter this sort of expression in. So the first context might be you're sitting on a beach in Tahiti uh, trying to figure out how to open a coconut. Hey, maybe the fact that Kim has a knife uh, could help you out in that endeavor. You can think of another context where somebody says Kim's got a knife. And the context is Daryl has just crashed into Kim's car. And Kim gets out of her car looking angry with a butcher knife in her hand. Uh, that's not nearly so helpful in that particular case, right? So in the, um, here's another context actually. So in the first context, uh, the sentence provides information. And in the second context, the sentence is a warning. And I should really eliminate this last uh, 
Yeah, well, now I, now I understand what I was doing there. So anyways, the first context, uh, the sentence is, or the utterance is uh, providing information. And in the second context, the utterance is a warning. It's the same sentence used in both contexts, however. Okay, so um, pragmatics is the study of how meaning is derived from context. I think we've not gone over that enough by now, but pragmatics is also the study of how language is used in context. Uh, and just so you know uh, what this means, Haha. <laughs> so pragmatics um, is a word derived from ancient Greek, as are a lot of terms in linguistics. So pragma means or meant deed in ancient Greek. Uh, and there's an even earlier form, um, which is a verb form in ancient Greek called prasein, uh, from which this word is derived. And prasein means to do. So in a sense, we're thinking about how we can do things with language when we think about the meaning of utterances as they're uh, spoken in context. So. We can use language to do things, um, which may be a bit of a surprise, but it's something that we do every single day of our lives. Uh, when we use language to do something, we are performing what is called a speech act, uh, sensibly enough, right? <clears throat> so uh, this is where looking at the quick write beforehand will come in handy, but I'm gonna ask you now, what can we do with the following expression? So if we say, time out, what do we do? Or if we say shotgun, what happens then? Or if you say jinx, what happens then? Um, I'm going to answer these as I think about them, and I'm going to let you think about them yourself for a second. But the meaning of these expressions is what they do, how they change the world. Um, so, for instance, timeout in an athletics context um, is the way I normally think about it. Like if you call a timeout in a game of basketball or whatever, uh, it stops the clock from running and then you get to, you know, go talk to your team for a little bit and then you go back out on the floor uh, and you continue playing after that. But simply uttering timeout or, you know, sometimes in a basketball game, you can make this symbol uh, signal with your hands um, that will change uh, the way the game is playing, being played at that particular time. Um, other people think of timeout, uh, I, know, I know this from reading quick rights over the years, other people think of timeout is like what you do with a kid when they're um, behaving badly and you say that they're on timeout and they have to go, their, go to their room or just be silent or quiet for some time um, as a, a punishment effectively. <clears throat> so just making that utterance makes that happen afterwards. Uh, shotgun is a game that uh, I used to play uh, or lots of us I think used to play when we were younger. Uh, maybe you still do, I don't know, but um, you know, back in the uh, time of riding around in cars with your friends, like if you're about to go to some place um, and you start walking to the car, somebody might yell shotgun. That means that they get the privilege of sitting in the passenger, the front passenger seat in the car. Uh, and then there's various rules about um, whether or not uh, somebody yelling shotgun is a valid shotgun or whatnot. And I'll talk about those a little bit later too. Um, similarly, Jinx. Uh, is a game you might play when two people say the same word at the same time. Um, then somebody says jinx or whoever says jinx first, then the other person is not allowed to talk until um, they pay some sort of penalty um, to sort of undo the jinx after that. Uh, so these are all kind of like, well, this is a little kid's game. This is more like a teenager game, uh, what have you. But um, by simply uttering something, you change the world in some way. Um, there are consequences of that action of simply speaking. Um, and I'll mention as well uh, that often when I do the quick write and ask people what shotgun means, uh, a lot of people will respond that it's a type uh, or a way to uh, drink alcohol quite quickly. So if you thought about that first, uh, you're not alone. But that's a different kind of game and not exactly a speech act. So I'm not going to say anything further about it. But if you want to do it, go right ahead. All right. So speech acts are not just simply one word phrases that we blurt out at particular moments in time. Uh, they can also be performed with complete sentences. So uh, if I say John read the book, so this is kind of a standard sentence that we've been thinking about in terms of like syntax. Uh, we don't think about necessarily why we would say it or what meaning it would have um, or what use it would have, but it's an assertion uh, as it's normally used. So John read the book, um, providing some information about the world basically to your listener. Did John read the book? The use of that or the meaning of that is that it's question and you want to get some information from your listener when you say it. Please pass the salt is a request. Kim's got a knife. Uh, we saw it could be used in different ways, but um, generally speaking, um, it could be used as a warning if you're worried about the fact that Kim has a knife. Get out of here is an order. 
I will love you forever is a promise, so on and so forth. I'll give you a reason to cry uh, is a threat. Um, I'm sure you've encountered that one at some point in your life as well. Uh, okay, so there are some verbs whose meaning is the speech act that they perform. And these verbs are called performative verbs, handily enough. So uh, these make kind of the speech act uh, that they perform explicit, uh, and they basically kind of name it as they're doing it. So I bet you 10 bucks the flames will win. That is a bet, uh, as long as the other person agrees to it. Or I dare you to leave is a dare. I promise to buy you some ice cream is a promise. I nominate Batman for mayor of Gotham City. Or I call shotgun. You can kind of expand it like that if you wanted to. Um, that's trying to reserve that place in the car for yourself. Or I resign um, is simply a form of resignation. Uh, I confer on you the degree of Bachelor of Arts. We use these in sort of these really formal contexts, right? Uh, like graduations or marriages or what have you. Uh, I now pronounce you husband and wife, for instance. Um, yeah, so these are performative verbs. It turns out there are conditions on whether or not you can use them meaningfully or not. So a performative verb is only going to perform the action it describes if it's used in the present tense and with a first person subject. Uh, so for instance, you can say, I promise to buy you some ice cream tonight, and that works. Uh, that would be a legitimate promise. But you cannot say, John promises to buy you some ice cream tonight. Um, it depends on what John thinks about that uh, in order for it to be a promise. He has to actually make the promise. You can't do it. Or uh, I will I will promise to buy you some ice cream tonight. Uh, that's not so much a promise about the ice cream as it is a sort of promise to make a promise rather. Um, so yeah, that one's uh, a bit sketchy. Or But we promise to buy you some ice cream tonight would work um, because that's still in the present tense uh, and using a first person subject. Um, so the conditions are met in that particular case. And I'm using a new notation here, by the way. Um, this, rather than using an asterisk before these sentences, I'm using this sort of crosshatch or pound symbol, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's, um, is that a hashtag, I guess? Yeah, so anyways, uh, that denotes that these, when you utter these sentences, um, they're not actually performing the speech act that they seem to be performing on the surface, right? Uh, so it's sort of pragmatically um, or unpragmatic, I guess you might say. It's, uh, well, we'll learn a term in a minute here that it's infelicitous, that it's simply not working pragmatically um, in contrast to sort of like an ungrammatical sen sentence, which is where the syntax just doesn't fit together um, according to the rules of the language. This, these are, sentences are not working according to the rules of pragmatics. Um, I can also let you know that if a sentence sounds fine with hereby, it is being used performatively. Uh, so you can say, I hereby promise to buy you some ice cream. So this is a funny little word. Uh, and this is kind of where it fits into the language that it helps things, um, you know, be functional speech acts effectively, uh, or formally denotes that they are um, functionally, uh, functional speech acts. So I hereby pronounce you man and wife. By saying this, you are becoming married, so on and so forth. I hereby dub thee George. Uh, I hereby challenge you to a duel. Um, or, But you cannot say, um, I hereby walk around the block. Uh, you cannot use this for not speech acts. So walking around the block is an act. It's just not a speech act. To do it, you have to actually walk around the block. This would only apply to things you can accomplish simply by saying them. So you cannot also say, I hereby sing. Uh, I guess you could possibly sing this and it would work. Um, but it's not the use of hereby or the simply uttering the sentence that makes it happen. You actually have to sing, right? But a promise is a promise. You just have to say it uh, as long as the other conditions are met for its um, validity. Uh, you can also say things like smoking is hereby forbidding. For, sorry, smoking is hereby forbidden. Uh, so you can forbid things this way. Uh, this is just in the passive um, voice rather than the active voice, but you're the one who's actually um, forbidding the smoking in that case. Okay, um, so like I said, you can't always perform a speech act just by saying something. Other conditions have to be met. So like um, you have a, an example of a man speaking to his wife and he says, I hereby divorce you. Sorry, it's not that easy. Um, it wasn't that easy to get married either. Uh, some other formal conditions have to be met. Uh, in the, according to the law of the land for a divorce to actually happen. Uh, an unmarried couple is talking with the bartender and the bartender says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Ha ha ha, the opposite case of that. It doesn't work, right? Um, so 
The conditions which must be fulfilled for a speech act to be carried out properly are known as felicity conditions, which are also known as appropriateness conditions. And I'm gonna pause here at this particular moment in time and go to a little video, which these conditions always remind me of. Um,